This is January 31st, 2002. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. We're privileged to have with us today John Coughlin. John, welcome. Thank you. And I understand they call you Jack, so we'll right. do this for the tape. May I ask you when you were born? 1922. And your current address? Wellesley, Massachusetts. And, and where were you born? Swampscott, Massachusetts. So you're a real Yankee. Well, yes, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, okay. And your marital status? Married. And children? Five. Grandchildren? Ten. <laughs> okay. Where and when did you enter the military services of the United States? I enlisted in the Army in New Haven, Connecticut in 1942. 42. And why did you join the Army? Because I couldn't get in the Navy Air Corps. I tried right after uh, Pearl Harbor to uh, enlist in the Naval Air Corps. I was in college at the time. And for months I chewed carrots and drank carrot juice to improve my eyesight, but it didn't work out. So. Finally, a kindly chief petty officer said, son, you're not going to make it. So I said, okay, and I enlisted in the Army. This was early 42? Yeah. You, you yeah. tried right after Pearl Harbor. So oh, right away. I couldn't this is wait January or February. Yeah. How long did you drink carrot juice? Probably four or five months. So we were up to about June of yeah, 40, June July, something like 42. That. Yeah. And wh where did you go in through, through New Haven? Well, yeah, I enlisted in New Haven, and then I was put in the Reserve Corps until January of 43. What is the Reserve Corps? Can you explain that? Well, it was a device. I was in college at the time, so that the Army uh, left me in college. They said, stay, we don't know what you're going to do with you. So there were thousands of people all over the United States. It's kind of a holding pen until yeah, sort of you Exactly, just yeah. what it was. Until I decided what branch had put us in and where we'd go. And, so, because they were flooded with, as you know, with applications. Did you finish college? No. Oh, well, I period? did later, but not then. Okay. So, where did where did where did the army put you when you first reported for active duty? Well, when I first reported for active duty, I went up to Camp Devens, Massachusetts, and we were there maybe a week, and then I was shipped to Fort Eustace, Virginia, where my basic training started. At Camp Devens, did you go through a process that determined what you would be for the rest of the time you were in the Army? Well, we took, a, uh, we took some kind of aptitude test, I remember that, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I don't, uh, I just vaguely remember them. I don't know what purpose was accomplished, except that we could read or write or something. I don't know, frankly. And, but uh, after that five days, <laughs> yeah. Some of you went one where and somewhere they went somewhere else. So well, a, a decision had been made about what you were going to do. Apparently, yeah, because I think I think my brother was came there with me. As a matter of fact, this is really going back a long time, and he ended up in the Air Corps, and I ended up in, uh, as I say, Fort Eustis for basic training in uh, anti-aircraft. So I guess you're right. I guess they did decide who was going to go where. I'm going back a long time. Looking back over this, uh, whatever, 60 years or whatever, uh, is that something you really wanted to do in your military career? I couldn't wait to get in the Army. That, that is to say, question. did you want to be in an anti-aircraft unit? I didn't really care. At that point, I didn't care what I did. I just wanted to get into the service and go overseas and so forth. Did you have something that they, I guess they refer to as basic training? Did you yes. learn to march and shoot rifles yeah. and things like I that? Was I had, that had some ROTC training in college, as a matter of fact, uh, in an artillery unit. And then I flunked out of that. And interesting aside, uh, as I recall it, over half the class were uh, civilian townspeople in New Haven, not, student, not kids like me. And uh, most of the uh, undergraduates, as was I, uh, didn't fare too well at the end. So we were dropped. And I guess the town, most of the townspeople, as far as I know, uh, were, were commissioned. But that always struck me as curious. 
sitting at 17 years old, 18, sitting in class with people who were considerably older, at least to me they were. And they were townspeople who would somehow they got in the ROTC. But anyway, that's the way it, that's the way it happened. That's, that's kind of unique. I don't think we've heard about that yeah. before. Would you tell us about your training as to shooting anti-aircraft guns? Well, we were introduced to them at, uh, at camp at, at uh, Fort Eustis, and I don't remember too much about the training, frankly. Uh, it was pretty basic, and I think it was just a general overview because I was sent to OCS from there to Camp Davis, North Carolina, which was a uh, anti-aircraft school, and that's where I was really that, that uh, that's when I really got into the big guns. Tell us about the guns. What kind were they? Well, they were 90 millimeters, and they were big rascals, and uh, they were uh, they were uh, similar to the German 88 millimeter. And the Germans had become very effective using them as anti-tank weapons, which was a novel idea the American Army hadn't stumbled on, I guess. We used them strictly for anti-aircraft, and. Uh, Following OCS, I was sent to Camp Edwards on the Cape, and it was in the winter of 40, 44. It was a brutal winter, I remember that. And we fired at targets were being pulled by airplanes. They'd go off the Cape, and we'd shoot our guns at it and try and knock down the targets. And it was a very interesting time for a lot of reasons. One is it was bitterly cold, and most of the company that I was then assigned to, which is the 162nd AAA Battalion, were Southerners. And, uh, at, at Camp Edwards in the Camp winter? Camp Edwards, yeah. And Great. I remember over 60, 50 or 60 percent got pneumonia. It was wicked cold, and I was a Northerner, so. However, that uh, we all survived. And had some interesting experiences down there. One time we clipped, a, we almost hit a plane that was pulling the target, which was uh, caused some consternation among the Air Force, but we didn't. And rightfully hit, so. We didn't hit it. <laughs> How could you, you're shooting at a, were you, is, was, a, was it a sleeve being towed? Yes. It, what, is yeah. that what you were shooting yeah. at? Yeah. Exactly. And did, when they landed, did they show you the sleeve, or how did you know how close you had come to shooting? I think the colonel got us, would get us together, our colonel, and tell us how poorly we were doing. I, I'm not sure we won any medals for accuracy. But we were new at it. I mean, and these were big, these were big guns, and big big shells. We had crews. Uh, I had one gun as a second lieutenant. I was in charge of a gun, and I think there was six or eight guys uh, running that just that one piece of uh, equipment. Did you learn at one and the same time how to shoot a a gun and to become an officer? Was this going on at the same time? Well, the basic rifle training, so was that everybody got. I guess when you first went in the army, I got in uh, Eustis, for Eustis. No, I meant to shoot this 90 millimeter gun. No, I no, I didn't get into that until I until I went to uh, I went to OCS. OCS was first. Yeah. Let's that's... back up then and talk about that. Can you remember the process that made you from a civilian into a an officer and a gentleman? <laughs> How quickly did that take place? Ninety days. Ninety day wonder. Yeah, yeah, classic. Do you look back on that and see that it made sense, or that my God, despite what they taught me, I turned out to be a good officer? How would you characterize your training? I think the training was good, as a matter of fact. It was a, it was rigid discipline. I mean, you know, everything was spit and polished, and. Uh, Towards the end, I mean, we took we'd take the long hikes and so forth, full field packs, and then get back and covered with mud and have to fall out in 20 minutes and your dress blues or whatever they gave us, you know. I thought the training was very good, and the uh, the, the the training on learning how to fire the guns and plot the use the radar, which we had, we called it the director. And I never got in this big trailer, but they're the ones, the people in that, the engineers, or the people with some engineering capacity, I guess, were the ones who inside would tell us how to set the, set the guns. Were the guns set manually? Yeah, they were. Did somebody yell out of the trailer, move it two feet to the left? I don't whether we had earphones on or, or what they did. Frank, I don't remember how we did it. 
because I didn't, I wasn't in the artillery very long. I got out of that when there was a surplus of AAA second lieutenants, and they sent me. And I became an engineer in six weeks. After you became an officer, a second right. lieutenant, yeah. and after training on the guns, yeah. you left this training to become an engineer. Was it I was sent a surplus of yeah, officers, surplus yeah. of AA off, AAA officers. So I was sent down to a Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which is an engineering camp. And there, in a six-week course, we studied the broad concepts of engineer officers, uh, for which I was totally unqualified. I had no more idea of engineering. <laughs> I just didn't. I didn't know a monkey wrench from a screwdriver. But. Uh, there were some very bright guys, and a lot of combat veterans were there as instructors. So you paid attention because when you got into defusing mines uh, or shells or things like that, I mean, we, it, we as we, they say, it focuses your attention. They, they, they yeah. caught our attention quickly with that yeah. stuff, and we learned how to build bridges and so forth, Bailey bridges, those big iron bridges, and uh, we had very very good instructors, and I liked them all. They're all they're all good guys. They'd all been in combat, so there wasn't much chicken down there. Where are you in 1944 now? I'm at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. In, in, in sense of time, summer, uh, oh, fall. Oh, uh, 44, uh, 44. I was on the Cape, and then I think I went to Belvoir in the spring. I went. I went. I went to a couple of schools on the. I went to a mine mine school in Texas. I believe for two weeks, sort of a side trip. Learn how to defuse mines. And I'm really going from memory now. I remember it was Camp Maxie, I think it was. What kind of mines are these? The are mines these land the, mines? Yeah, okay. anti-tank mines, you anti -tank. know, the little hedge hoppers, whatever they call them. Can and you tell us how to diffuse a mine? Very slowly. <laughs> very carefully. Very carefully, on, yeah. your, on your knees, uh, with your bayonet. You'd poke around to see if you could find the mine. And then, I don't remember, but you had to take the top off or something. I just I don't remember what the details were then. You were a second lieutenant. Yeah. Did they send second lieutenants out to defuse mines? In combat? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We had second lieutenants teaching us from Italy. A lot of them came from Italy, the Fifth Army, where my brother was, as a matter of fact. Yeah. The, the, yeah. They they use second lieutenants. I guess I'll ask the question I asked you a minute ago. Is this something you wanted to do with your career in the Army, is go out there and look around for mines? <laughs> no, mines were not uh, particularly attractive to anybody. Uh, you know, seriously. No, I, uh, it was part of the package. Again, I couldn't wait to get into the service, and I wanted to do something useful. My father had been a highly decorated veteran of World War I with the 1st Division, the Big Red One and won the Silver Star and the Purple Heart and the citation from the commanding general for gallantry in action. And although he never discussed much of it, this, this, this uh, loyalty, this uh, patriotism, I think, you know, sunk through. Those are impressive credentials. They I really can, are, yeah. and he was a very wonderful guy. You, you folks, if I'm following you uh, chronologically here, you, you're about to experience D-Day, or it takes place while you're down D-Day took yeah. place well, from uh, once I became an engineer. Uh, in Fort Belvoir, I was sent to Cape Cod to uh, the 162nd... Uh, no, I take that back. This was, this was following the Cape. I was sent to Arkansas to the 1477 Engineer Maintenance Company. And this would have been the spring, late spring of 44. And in June, do you hear about this thing called Normandy Beach? Yeah, yeah, we heard yeah. all about that, yeah. What were you doing in Arkansas now? Well, the 1477th was, an, was a, I call it a maintenance company in the Engineer Corps. And a very unusual, I think there, I was told there were only six or seven in the entire Army. And it wasn't assigned originally to any specific division or corps, but it was full of uh, highly, highly skilled technicians. We had youngsters that could not only excellent bulldozer drivers, but they could repair watches, 
rebuild tanks. They were welders, electricians, carpenters, very highly skilled, talented uh, group of people. And, and, a, a, uh, and a, we had a super captain who had been a former gold miner and an a interesting guy. Would this be characterized as, as an elite unit? Was, were there other units like this? Or well, was this th there were six or seven maintenance companies I heard in the whole army. And we were not, as I said, we were not proud of any particular division or anything. We sort of floated around. We ended up in Europe supporting, I believe it was the Seventh Armored. But that's, that's ahead of myself. So where, it was where, elite where to Where were you in, in Arkansas? Is this Fort Smith? Chafee. Chafee? Fort, well, Fort Smith. I think that's the name of the town. Camp Chafee was the camp. It was a huge camp. And I know there were some armored divisions there. And we, we were there. We were there all summer. I remember 44. And we went on maneuvers and we were approved for overseas duty. Um, I just remember, I don't know what we did, but we had to do something. They said, you're all set, you're all trained. That's, that's an interesting point. Uh, can we expand on that? Is there a momentum that builds and somebody's watching you as a unit and finally, as you've just said, somebody makes a decision, these guys are ready. And did you feel that, that internally? Did, did you feel that, yeah, let, let's go and we're ready to go over there? Yeah, I did. I think that everybody, right down to Buck Privates felt, you know, we'd done enough training, we'd been on enough field maneuvers, we'd been out on the boonies, and we'd hiked and walked, and, uh, and I'm not complaining, it was just part of the deal, and we, they learned how to give us good food out in the, in the, uh, in the pine brush of Arkansas, and we learned how to repair trucks and find gasoline, and, and we had a ton of equipment. We had, we had back, we had bulldozers with us, we had flatbeds, we had cranes on these trucks that you see driving around here. We had about six Jeeps. We had a lot of two and a half tons and a, and a ton of equipment. We, we were at, it was a machine shop. It was a machine, bigger than a machine shop. We could, do, we could literally do anything. We could repair anything. I can tell you stories when, when we get to the Philippines, particularly what we did over there. But uh, they were highly talented. They came from something like 40 or 50 states. And there were Poles and Irishmen and Germans and Jewish kids and all kinds. We had a great captain who was a freewheeler. It wasn't too much for discipline. I mean, he didn't really care whether you saluted him every time. And uh, I made a cup of, uh, the, the, the exec, as a matter of fact, and I became very close personal friends. He was a wonderful, wonderful guy who since died, and I think it was with great affection. He was a fireman from New York City. From what you're telling us, and the, the preparation, the training you all collectively had, you're waiting to then to be paired with some other outfit, a division or some group that needs fixing. They've got stuff that's broken. Yeah, exactly. So they shipped us right to, to Europe, and it's just what we did. Tell us about going overseas. Well, we went overseas on a little, little ship, as I recall it, uh, I used to know the name, it's in that book, so I can't think of the name. We, 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 we went north, and the exec got married, I remember one day, and I went to the wedding, and the next day we were on alert. He couldn't even, he couldn't call anybody to do anything, he just really, they froze you and said, you know. Where were you? We were at, uh, in New Jersey, I don't know, we were at Fort Dix or someplace. And then we went down to the docks and hopped on the ship and off we went. Did you go out of New York or the port of Newark? Yeah, another port of New York. And it was an interesting trip as we got towards Europe. Uh, they, they, they dropped some depth bombs one night. And uh, of course we all came topside on that in a hurry, but didn't say anything. Were you in a convoy or, or by yourself? No, I think we must have been in a convoy. It was a small ship. It was a small ship. Can you tell us uh, personally how you feel on a uh, ship going overseas at time of war, everything's blacked out and you're, any apprehensions or? No, I don't what think What were your so. feelings about no. this? I think we were, at least I can speak for myself, I, 
as I said, I just, I remember writing my dad, particularly in the summer of 44, saying, I wish they'd send me somewhere. I'm sick of Arkansas's woods and walking around with K rations and, you know, let, let's get going, let's do something. I mean, most of my pal, a lot of my, my kid brother was in Italy, was in Sicily, and then Italy with the Fifth Army. And I had a sister who joined the Waves, who was in the Intelligence Corps in Boston. And I just, uh, I was anxious to get going. So I went with no particular feeling or trepidation or anything else. We got on the boat and off we went. Finally, we had, we had finally, a couple of kids yeah. in our outfit that were very upset. I remember talking to one of them, one, one older man who really broke up before he we went overseas. I had a long talk with him. He was in my platoon, I think, and he was leaving his wife and his children, and he was justifiably very upset. I mean, but I was uh, 20 years old, single. I mean, I had no, no particular tie. So the ship, so the, on the ship, we uh, didn't do much <laughs> except eat. And, you know, we got over there, landed in La Havre, which was an absolute mess, uh, this, this report been bombed by smithereens. Anyway, we get off there and they... Your first stop is France then, rather than England or any place yeah, else. Yeah, we didn't stop in yeah. England, no. We were right to, right to France. We were there, we, we were billeted on the grounds of a chateau, as I recall it. And uh, I remember talking to the civilians with my high school French and giving the little kids candy and talking to the parents who were farmers drinking wine with them. And then they shipped us right through uh, Holland and Belgium, right into Germany. And this was the, only, the first and only time we ever got into any uh, combat zone. And we only in it about a month or six weeks, I guess. And we were attached, I think, to the 7th Armored. I think that was the ones that we were supporting. We were under General Montgomery. Corps. He was a corps commander, and we were with the U.S. Ninth Army. I think it was General Simpson, as I recall it. So we finally got a home, in a sense. We finally, somebody said, we want you here now. And we had a fascinating time in Europe. Uh, we saw a lot of devastation. Uh, no one ever shot at me that I was aware of. But we, at one point, uh, we were in, in Germany in a, in a town called Boitzenburg and the captain, and I was off for the day or the night or something, I was on duty anyway, and he sent back and he said, load up all our two and a half tons with soup bowls. We were, we were billeted in a soup bowl factory. In fact, we were sleeping in it on concrete floors, which we got used to, as all your veterans can tell you that. And so he said, load them up with the soup bowls. So, because I said, I'll, I will, Skipper, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go, where, where are we going? Wh who wants them? And we went up to a little town called, uh, uh, what was the name of it? I'll think of it in a minute. But there was a, there was a concentration camp there. And the 82nd Airborne had, had Ludwig, gone into it. Ludwig West, is that it? What's that? Ludwig West? No. No, I, I'll, I'll look it up. It's in, it's in the book. Uh, Excuse me, but uh, are you into 1945 now? Yeah. So we've had the Battle of the Bulge, and oh, we're getting yeah. into the yeah into the Germany. Yeah, this yeah. this is Alrighty. this is March of 45. Okay, so we're two months away from the end of the war, right? And you're beginning to discover camps like this. Well, yeah, we it's the only one I saw, but, but it, and it was a holding camp, and. Uh, this, this buddy of mine, whom I said the executive officer and I, the captain, we were in the town of Boitzenburg. I wish I could think of the name of this. Was a, Woblin was the name of this little town. Woblin. Woblin. And the skipper, the captain said to us, he said, you and Joe, Jack, to me, take a jeep and fight. We've got to go north. We're following the division. We've got to go somewhere. We've got to stay somewhere. Find a town that we can go into and at least put up our quarters. So we did, and we ended up, this is how we ended up in Boitzenburg, prior to going to the camp. That's how we got there. We got to this town of Boitzenburg, which is just over the Elbe River, I think. We had to wait at the Elbe because there was some fighting going on there. 
And then, this, as I said, I was off for the day, and he, wanted, he came back. We were in a soup bowl factory, which had been converted to make guns or something by the Germans, but, and a lot of Russians around, too, Russian prisoners. Uh, but anyway, he wanted all these soup bowls, so we loaded up a two and a half ton with literally hundreds of them. We took them up and we went to this camp, and this was the first time I'd ever seen it, and this was just a holding camp. There were no ovens there, but there were thousands of dead people stacked up like cordwood, and I have pictures of it in here. And I talked to some of them, uh, who were really in, in horrendous shape. I mean, just it was, it was inconceivable, unbelievable to me. And one building, uh, the bodies were stacked up like cordwood, and the open graves. We we made the Germans or the 82nd Airborne really made the Germans dig the prisoners up, and I took pictures of them digging up the get the farmers in the pits and dig up the bodies and give them a proper burial. And uh, I went, and there was a hospital. I think that may have been in the town itself. I had a red cross on the roof, and I went in that and went up to the top floor, I remember, and these guys started screaming, these prisoners, and a nurse came out and said, you have a shoulder holster on. I carried a 45 on my shoulder, and she said, it's, it's frightens them, so please take it off and please leave, which I did. But it was just a, it was an unbelievable experience. I wrote my father a long letter and I said, it's incomprehensible to me. I've, I've never seen anything like this before. Jack, prior <clears throat> to your arriving at the camp, your senior officer had said drive up yeah. north and all of that. Had you guys heard that there were such camps? I and, think and we'd heard about it, John. news to you? It didn't register. I don't, I, you, you hear everything. I call it kind of rumors about it. War's going to end, you know. Uh, I've been asked the question many times. I don't recall any particular, uh, I don't recall anything particularly, no. So I've you heard came about upon it, it pretty much. We had a Jewish kid in our outfit, and I think he probably had mentioned it to us at one point. He came from Luxembourg, and he'd gotten out, which bothered him terribly. He just kept thinking he should have stayed with his family. So I don't think, no, I don't, it, it was hard to comprehend, unless you saw it. I mean, you just couldn't imagine people would treat people that way. Did you have anything to do with the German civilians surrounding this camp? Did you go out and get work details or uh, have anything uh, no. to make them confront what they had well, done Well, we didn't there? have to do it because the 82nd Airborne was in there then. And they Is this there. the Band of Brothers yeah, thing? Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. I had a pal in the 82nd Airborne, as a matter of fact, and I ran into him. And I found an article. Th this, this, this is the most significant event of the war for me, and so if I, if I get too much of it, cut me off, but a lot of things come to mind. There's, there was an, I, was watching a British, I was watching a TV show about 10 years ago. And this was in the British sector, Montgomery, and by Gary, on TV comes this camp. And no one's ever heard of it. It wasn't D D Dachau or Buchenwald or any of those. It was Wobelin, the holding camp. And uh, it was on television. Then I heard uh, there was an article written by a uh, chaplain in the 82nd Airborne who had been in there. And I dug the article up and I, and I read it. And he, he, he filled me in a lot of detail, that the prisoners were dying at the rate of 500 a day and so forth, and the Germans didn't know there was a camp was there, which was ridiculous, it was right outside the town. It's like the camp here, in, or the camp on, down the street in Wellesley, and you're in Natick. And I couldn't understand that, and I also, I'm a Catholic, and I just couldn't understand the Germans are essentially a Catholic race. And I'd go to church, I went to a couple of masses in, in with a German priest, and I, I couldn't reconcile what I was looking at, people beside me there in this play. I remember telling my mother that, and uh, just couldn't, I just couldn't believe this. Uh, you, people could be treated this way. I remember walking, and some gentleman in front of me fell over dead in this camp, just plopped down dead. And I remember it was a hot day, and there were big fires, and they were burning up all the vermin-infested blankets and everything, and these people were huddled around. And I guess when you're undernourished, you're cold. And I, and I think there were children there, little kids. 
I know there was a woman's camp near it, and it's all sort of merged, and it's 60 years ago, so, or 50, 60 years ago. Can you make a subtle distinction here? Uh, you refer to this as a, a holding camp. Yeah. Uh, is that they would send them to other places Apparently. to be killed? They were, they were, yeah, well, th those that were survived. They didn't feed them or anything. I mean, they just let them die. They didn't have the oven. My point is there were no ovens there. I didn't see any of that. These people just died by themselves. And this article that this Reverend Wood wrote, which I've read, explains more details than I ever knew about. I mean, I had no reason to, to me it was a concentration camp and it was just a stunning thing to see. But uh, anyway, the, um, that was that. We, we brought the soup bowls up and they, some of the sergeants said that when they brought them in, the prisoners would storm the trucks because they didn't have any food with them, but the prisoners didn't know that. They saw the bowls and they figured there must be food, but the, the uh, army medics were there and they put some in the hospital. I remember watching the German, German women feeding some of these prisoners in the hospital milk with a spoon, you know. 24 hours later, they didn't know the camp existed. What a lot of rubbish that was. I just I couldn't, uh, I just, uh, I know if where, where did the food come from? Well, I suppose the Americans provided. I mean, we, I handed out everything I had. Cigarettes, uh, candy bars, whatever I had in my pocket. And uh, I guess the British, the British were there too. The British, the American 82nd Airborne, the British troops were in the area. I guess, and, and our own, because we had food with us, our company. We didn't, get, we didn't give them any food per se. I think the 82nd did and the <coughs> British people. But uh, it was an appalling, appalling scene. It was just unbelievable. And it was just a two-bit camp. There were thousands of them. And people say, you know, I didn't know it existed. Well, you know. Yeah, thank you for bringing that to our attention, yeah. Unbelievable. So let's, anyway, let's, that, that let's was look at something that uh, you you wrote to your dad. You wrote to your family. You've got a brother and a sister in the service. Yeah. Did you hear from them when you were moving along all this time? <laughs> no, I didn't. And I it was a standard joke. My brother was in Sicily with the Fifth Army. He was seventeen years old. He was a T T5. With Mark Clark and uh, yeah, and then he went into up. Italy. Yeah, and he's with the Air Force on a ground troop, and there were three of them, and they recon fields to see if they could handle bombers, fighters, or what. So they were generally with the infantry, and occasionally even ahead of the infantry, looking. And when things simmered down in Europe, particularly, I thought, gee, it'd be nice to go see him. He's just across the border, but I couldn't get a pass to go. And I and I said to some colonel, some West Point or somewhere. <laughs> God, we're in the same army. It's my kid brother I want to go see. But I just couldn't get a pass to go see him, so I never did. And your sister was back in the she States? She was in the States. She yeah. was at the Boston Navy Yard as a, um, in, in the intelligence school. And I had one other sister who was still in school. So the family was well represented in the service. Before we end this tape, I'd like to... Um I'd like to know what you and your father talked about when you got home, but we'll look at that in a couple of minutes after you do get home. But what did your outfit do after it left this particular place? We went to the Philippines. No, literally from that camp. Did oh, you go that anywhere? Camp? Yeah. Well, we stayed there for a considerable length of time, as I recall it. I don't know, several weeks. The war ended anyway. We found out about it a couple of days later. We helped liberate some Russian prisoners one of whom spoke fluent English, and he's, he's worth a story by himself. I had long talks with him at night. I don't know if you want all of this in this. Uh, we have a time limitation, yeah. so let's get through your career, okay. and then whatever is left, we'll get back to. Well, we, we, then we went, back to, uh, we went back to Marseille, France, and I think the Camp Lucky Strike, and I believe there were 40 or 50,000 troops there, and they packed us up and shipped us to the Philippines. And we got on the SS Brazil, unescorted, and 40 day, 39 days later we got off in Manila. There was no thought whatsoever of the war's over, hey, we're going home. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but not us. <laughs> Why not you? We didn't have enough points. And also, uh, everything was a point system. 
you get so many points for a medal, so many points for overseas duty, so many points for this, so many points for that. And second lieutenants, I don't think they even knew they existed anyway. Although by that point, when we got to Marseille, I became a first lieutenant. But anyway, we, they needed us. We, they, we knew that. It was an engineering, highly specialized engineering group, and they needed us for the invasion. Of Just Japan. take one second here. You went from uh, fairly north Germany down through back through France right. to, to the very uh, Mediterranean port yes, of Marseille. Exactly, yeah. What did you see on the way down? You looked through the wreckage of Europe or what? Uh, it was fascinating. I took a jeep by myself. I got the captain to give me a jeep. And, and, and you I, drove I, all that way? I alone. I went alone. He said, just be in Marseille, uh, Marseille in six days or something. I said, okay. I want to see it. I'd heard a lot about Europe from my father. Oh yeah, I saw a ton of wreckage, and, but I stopped in a lot of the little towns off the way and I'd sleep in the Jeep, I guess. I don't know where I slept, but I'd, I'd go into the local pubs, and drink wine, eat cheese with the, the French, with my high school French, talk to them, you know. Saw these pretty little chateaus all the way down, lovely fields and so forth and so on. I had been in Paris on for a couple of days during the war, so I, I knew something about that. But I went down alone, to answer your question, all the way down the Loire Valley, right to Marseille. That was a very memorable experience, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was very interesting to me, because the war was over, and uh, people said, how'd you get enough gasoline? There was never any shortage of gasoline. You used an Oklahoma credit card. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, the Brazil is sitting there waiting for you, and that's a pretty big ship. Very big. 5,000 troops, 3,500 colored, 1,500 white. And it was, was it just your unit or oh, were other no, units? No, were no, a lot no, of we, infantry guys going yeah, over with you? Yeah, we had infantry, artillery. Oh, we have 5,000 people. That's uh, about half a division, really. But it was a, it was a mishmash. I don't remember who was on I mean, I talked to some of the guys, but... Mostly we stuck with our own people. And you went out through the Straits of Gibraltar and yep. never looked back. You we were went on through, a went ship through, a long time. We yeah. went through the Panama Canal. We did get off the Panama Canal for six hours, I think. Had some ice cream and steak and then hopped back on. And so, but essentially we were on the boat for 39 days, yeah. And, and in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the, the engines broke down. This deathly silence and after listening to this rumble. For <laughs> yeah, you keep saying, what was that? <laughs> yeah, well, when, the, when it broke down, it stopped cold. The ship stopped cold. Again, are you alone? No, uh, no, no other ships around no, you? This, was un this whole trip was unescorted. They said the Brazil was too fast for a submarine. Not when it stopped dead in the water. Not when it stopped dead in the water. And then I found out late, a lot later, the Indianapolis was sunk during that period of time. That's when they sunk that. Uh, that was going up from Tinian to yeah, uh, the Philippines. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there were some subs around. Anyway, they didn't, they didn't get us. It's a good thing because the, we, we watched the Navy gunners. They couldn't hit. <laughs> what, what was your feeling about, uh, you'd done quite a bit up to this point, and now you're going up against the Japanese. I assume they're priming you for the invasion of Japan. Yeah. Where were you to land and what were you to do? I, well, I have no, any idea. I don't We never did see the battle plans. We were too. I mean, no, we I meant where, where was the Brazil? Well, we landed. Take we, you? The Brazil landed, went to uh, uh, Batangas, which is a town south of uh, Manila. And that's where we were stationed. I stayed on the ship till it got into Manila because I was in charge of getting all the equipment off and found at that point a letter from home that my father had died two months before. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I said no, something that's previous. No, that's right. Yeah. That was a t terrible shock, but anyway, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I couldn't do much about it then. They hadn't been able to reach me, that's all. He died while I was in France. And, uh, and I had an uh, interesting story. I had about 50 letters when I got to Manila, and I raised them in chronological order because we hadn't had any mail for two months. And I put them all in order, and I, I remember opening a letter from him, and, and then the next letter was from my uncle. And it was extended. My family was good. They wrote me. Uncles and aunts wrote me too. And so I opened his letter, my uncle's letter, up, and the clipping fell. I was a Lynn item, which is a paper now, like the tab. And uh, there's clipping of a marine that had been killed or wounded or something. And I thought, well, that's strange. I don't even know this guy. And it turned out, oh, it was my father's obituary. 
So that's how I knew that he died. Mm. And then with it was a letter from my uncle who gave me the whole story on his death. So there I sat on the dock by myself, and I was really lonesome at that time, I can tell you, say 8,000 miles away. However, I uh, went back. I, I was in charge of the equipment. I had to get off the ship and get it down to Batangas, which I did. And the skipper said, you want me to get you a leave? And I said, no, I don't, because there's nothing I can do now, and I think really I should stay here. I've been with this outfit now for two years, and I want to stay with them. This is my company, my outfit, and that's my job, and I'll stay with it. And I wasn't being a hero, but I really felt that. I, that's where my job was, right there. So I stayed and took my chances, and eventually, you know, got home a year later. What time of uh, 1945 were you in the Philippines? We we got there in uh, we got there in uh, probably June. So June. you had 60 days till the war ended, or something like that, within 90 days. Well, the war ended. Actually, they dropped the A bomb while we were at sea. We were, we were notified about that, although we didn't know what it was. No one seemed to know exactly what it was that they had done. It was some tremendous bomb. That, yeah, there was a big bomb. Yeah. yeah. And when I got, I was in Manila, I saw Japanese uh, people there coming in to set up the surrender, I guess. I mean, I remember seeing Japanese officers in some place. And the war ended, and I forget when it ended in the Philippines, May or June? No, it was August. August? Okay. Well, we were there anyway. And I left there the following June, I think. I was there about 10 months. You really didn't have points, did you? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's, they kept you a long time after what you'd been through. So where, what were you doing for 10 months then? Well, basically, we, we, we built an elaborate camp. <laughs> I look back on it. We were, remember, we were engineers, and I said at the very beginning, I give these kids credit. They literally could do anything. I had a Jeep of my own with a shortwave radio, and I could listen to the ball games driving around the islands. We swapped uh, 50 gallons of ice cream, I'm being a little liberal of my memory, with the Navy for two picket boats, which they were using to pick up sailors, uh, people had been shot down, they were surplus. So our guys traded, we gave them ice cream, because we could make ice cream, and we had the motors, and. We made it mechanically with Jap Zero motors or something. So we got two picket boats and we, we put a crew on it. And uh, every day of the week, part of the company could go on the boat, go fishing or whatever they wanted to do. We built beautiful quarters. We had a guy with us who had been a Disney artist. And he, he, he painted all the walls of our mess halls and everything. We had parachute silks, you know, different colors, which the Army, uh, they used. Uh, each color represented either ammo or food or something. Uh, we got it really very good showers, built a volleyball court. <laughs> it wasn't too tough, but it was boring. And we were really transferring equipment to the Philippine government. That's what we were really doing. Can you, let me ask a, a question here that I, after the war ended, yeah. and you've, we've all heard stories about stuff being dumped into Manila Bay, or they drive 500 jeeps off a cliff. Yeah, yeah. Did you see any of that? No, no, no way. We, we uh, no, I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of that. We turned our stuff, Batangas was the capital of Batangas province, and we were dealing with the hierarchy of Philippine governor, I guess. And we, our equipment was clean, and we maintained it, and gave them gave them equipment. And we didn't give them everything, and we kept enough for ourselves. And they, because the Philippines were, were freed, they, they liberated the Philippines. They didn't liberate them. They, uh, they got their independence in 45. And there was a lot of unrest among the troops. I remember this. We kept saying, why can't we go home? Why can't mm -hmm. we go home? And they had big meetings in Manila, which probably were communist-inspired, I guess. But I took the time, uh, the executive officer, my buddy, as I say, he had a cousin who had been interned at Santo Tomas with her husband during the war, and they lived up in North of Manila. We went up to see them a lot. He was a former army officer who gone out with MacArthur in the 30s, and they told us horrendous stories about the Jap occupation. 
the local Catholic church in Batangas was pretty well shot up, but it wasn't during the war. It was an earthquake prior to the war. They hadn't rebuilt it. And there were nuns there, some of whom came from Massachusetts, uh, and told us that the Japs treated them really pretty well. But I heard later that the Japs also killed the priests and a couple of the older boys. So I, and I talked to these, every chance I had to go out and talk to these people. I met them a doctor who was uh, extremely well educated. I remember he had ice cream. He invited us to his house one day and had, uh, gave us ice cream, which, or mil uh, fresh milk. I, I remember these little vignettes that along the way. I wanted to be a writer as a kid, so I, and I wrote, that's what I wrote my mother about 500 letters, right there. Put them in a book for my children. If I remember the point system correctly, you could figure out a year ahead to the day when you would get out. There, there was a date sure and certain, if not before, if they got rid of a lot of guys. Did you decide that uh, you were going to make good use of your time there in the Philippines? You had access to transportation and a whole nation to explore. Did you do that? Yeah, I did a lot of exploring, yeah. I didn't know exactly what I was going to... What I, what, I, what I didn't know, I knew when I had enough, I had enough points somewhere along the way, but there's only so many ships. I mean, you need to, you had to get home, you had to ship home, you had to have a boat. And one of the things we did while we were out there at my unit is we converted freighters into troop ships. We built, we built uh, bunks, and for which we were, got a citation, as a matter of fact. That was a principal occupation of ours for a period of time. So my question was, not do I have enough points, I had enough points somewhere along the line, but <laughs> I couldn't do, they wouldn't do me any good unless I could get on a boat and go home. And, uh, and the company gradually did. The, the skip of the captain got assigned back. Although I think he asked for an extension. I think he stayed an extra 90 days. He was, in a, he was quite a guy. What and, was your feeling about when the party's over and guys are starting to go and yeah. guys you've known for more than two years yeah. and you're down on the dock saying goodbye to people? No, I can you go to the dock. But well, can you... Yeah, well, Think no, about those I, yeah, days. I, yeah, I was sorry to see them go. We've been together for a couple of years. Uh, we've been lucky, uh, you know. Uh, I was sorry to see them go, sure. I wanted to get home. I, as I, I wanted to get out as much as I wanted to get in four years earlier. I wanted to get home, finish school, get a job, da-da-da-da-da-da. I take it you did all those things. Uh, you got home. Remember sailing home? I sure do. Sailing right into San Francisco under the bridge, <laughs> waving. <laughs> yeah, and then getting in a troop train and coming across the country. There was a TV last night that was a picture of that field in Arizona where they keep all the planes, airplanes, the airport, yeah. thousands. And I remember, yeah. I presume that's the field we went by. We got thousands of airplanes there. And uh, yeah, that I was sad, home. as I recall. Yeah. yeah, coming into Boston and uh, getting off the airport, we land in New York, or get out of the train in New York, or Fort Dix or someplace, flew to Boston. Guy got off the plane with me and said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Swampscott. He said, do you want to ride? And I said, I'd love it. I don't know who it was, just some guy was in uniform. He took me home and walked through the door and saw my mother and my two sisters and my brother. And the great adventure was over. Did your family sit down? Your dad's gone now, but yeah. did your mom and brother, sister, did, did you guys swap war stories or did, did you just go on from there? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I, uh, I, I, I may have talked with my brother, never talked a heck of a lot about it, and I never did either. I mean, it was behind us. He had seen some action, and I, I hadn't really done it. I was in a combat zone for six weeks, but, but he, because he was, his length of service he'd, in Sicily and Italy, he never, he didn't talk much about it, and I never asked him much about it. My mother gave me all the letters, and I remember him saying to me, after the war, how did you have time to write? <laughs> So much, but as I, you know, I wanted to be a writer, and I, I took advantage when I get a, like in the Philippines, like driving down through France by myself. I, I absorbed all this stuff and wrote it down in, in letters home to her. 
When you read those letters now or read your own journals, yeah. does it all come back to you like you're right there again? Well, I haven't reread them recently. I, I remember the concentration camp vividly because I took some pictures. I remember the Russian soldier that I got to know who had a brother in Boston. I remember. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I can remember it pretty well. I mean, I can't remember all the details, you know. You're here on a kind of a wintry day in New England now, and it's a long time since all that happened. Yeah. Is there one thing that stands out? Is is it the concentration camp, or in in your period of, of the military? What one thing pops into your head saying more think than the, anything else? I think else? the I think the most important thing. Yeah, I remember the camp, and I remember the Russian. I think the thing that why was I lucky? I was a, I was a second lieutenant. There were a dime a dozen. I could have just been easily as as easily assigned to an infantry outfit in France and got my head blown off. I mean, I was lucky. Why and why? I was nothing. I was just a twenty-year-old kid, you know had a bar on my shoulder and they needed lieutenants, particularly when they, in the war in Europe. And we could have been, I could have been shipped over there before the bulge or any of this stuff. So I was very fortunate and so I, I guess God must have been looking out after me. Is that the answer you've come to? Yes, you, it you, is. You ask a, a very important question. Is, is that your response? Yes, to, to the question. Yeah. I, I've, I've often wondered. I mean, I, w I was very fortunate. My brother died a few years ago, and the war left uh, had its effect on him. I mean, he was physically all right, but I took, my father's death was a terrible jolt to him. It, it was a jolt to me, but uh, and I think too about my mother, who who lived through the First World War with my father overseas and her brother overseas, and then 20 years later, Roosevelt says, well, "You never send your sons across the ocean," and bingo, two of us. She only has two boys, and we both go overseas. I think about these things, but I think I, I, I was lucky. I was, I was just lucky. I mean, you know, I got home, finished my education, got married, have five great kids, and uh, I've been very fortunate. And I thank the good Lord for that. And I don't wear my religion on my sleeve, but I, I certainly, uh, I certainly you think about. You spoke well of a lot of the men you served with. Yeah. Uh, people you met. Uh, was there a most memorable character that uh, was in your uh, life at that time? Well, I think in, in me and my unit, speaking of fellow, fellow soldiers. Any time that anybody you ran up against? Well, I met a Russian soldier when we were in this little soup bowl factory. I was on duty one night the war was going on, and a young Polish boy came wandering into our camp, terrified. And uh, uh, we had a lot of Polish kids in my outfit, so I got hold of one of the sergeants and said, "See what you can find out about this kid. He was frightened. He's a little boy, he's about 12 years old. Well, this kid had wandered through the forests and the woods, lost his parents and everything. And so we we scooped him up and made him a member of our company. We gave him a uniform and so forth and so on." But during that same period of time, uh, we had Russians working for us who had been prisoners that we had released, I guess, we, four or five of them. And one night, after everything was done, they, they would cook for us and clean up and so on. I was standing and one of them came over to me and said, Lieutenant, would you talk with me in English? And I said, sure. And he, he relayed me an extraordinary story. He was the only one that spoke English, and he would not talk in front of the other Russian soldiers. This, he and I would always talk alone. And he had been in, caught up in the Turkish massacre in Armenia, apparently, as a child, and had escaped. And the, the uh, I think he, had, he had escaped anyway, and he uh, was put into an orphanage and the lady that ran the orphanage wanted to send them to America, but she could only afford to send two or three of them, and he wasn't one of them. But his brother was one of them. So he came, or his, yeah, it was his brother or his cousin. So he came back, he went back to Russia anyway, and got married, was thrown into a concentration camp in 1937 for reasons he never understood, 
he was a watchmaker. He was released, and they put him in the army, he was captured at Minsk, uh, Minsk, uh, whatever it is. The Germans captured him and sent him down. We put him, I had two things. I wrote to my dad and asked him if he could find his brother who had come to Boston. My father died, so that, that ended, I never found. We put, this kid, however, this young man, we, we took with us down to Marseille. We smuggled him through the line. We were in the Russian zone at that point. So we had to smuggle him through the lines because the Russians wanted all their troops back. And we took him to Marseille. We gave him a jeep and a driver, and within one day he found his brother. He went to the Russian Orthodox Church or something and found his brother, whom he hadn't seen for, well, this in this case, 25 years. Where, where was his brother? In Marseille. In Marseille? His brother was in Marseille. Now, this I'm going from memory, but this is essentially correct. He found him through the church, uh, and I remember talking to him, because I had been talking to him a lot, and I said, uh, are you going to stay here? And he said, I can't. He said, I'm married, and I've got a couple of kids. I've got to go back to Russia. And this is one of life's mysteries. I wonder, what, what did he go back to? And the Russians didn't treat their prisoners very well. I mean, those who had been taken prison. I don't know, but I mean, you know. But it was an extraordinary story, and I have his name written down, and uh, that was it. He, he was unique. He was when, you, unique. when you talk about this factory making soup bowls, yeah. I keep, every time you mention that, I keep thinking of Schindler's List, that Schindler made soup bowls for the German army. Did he? I didn't know that. I just, did you ever look to see who owned that factory? No, or no? I didn't. I know that, <laughs> I remember some of the comical thing. When we got into this place, anyway, Joe and I figured, well, this is a good time, we'll stay here. Where are we going to stay? Well, we'll stay in the factory, at least it was covered. And the concrete floors, you get used to sleeping on concrete. But we'd go into the factory and take rolls of these soup bowls and throw them, <laughs> throw them around. <laughs> We did a lot of that. Skeet shooting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Jack, we're almost out of time here. I'd yeah. like to ask you, is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to put on this tape to, get, to tell your family, to tell historians, to tell yourself again? Well, I guess that I, I constantly think, and as I get older, I think even more how blessed we are in this country. I was in Hamburg, I was in Manila, the two most heavily bombed cities in the world. And I've seen little children groveling, and you can't say no to them, even though we had an anti-German, we couldn't talk to Germans in Germany, You're not supposed to, but I've seen such suffering in this world, such extraordinary suffering. And we're so, we're so lucky in this country, we, had no, we were never bombed. And, uh, that's the message I would say. Count your blessings. There were a lot of there were 12 million of us in the service, and I was no hero. But there were a lot of heroes, and I know some of them, and uh, we can never thank them enough for what they did. But uh, I think you know I I did my duty. I volunteered. I enlisted. I wasn't drafted, and uh, I did the best job I could while I was in the service, and I was lucky. I got out with my mind and my head screwed on right and no physical problems. Jack Coughlin, thank you very much. You're very welcome.